Okay, so it's 8 p.m. now, and we're going to start this live webinar. Uh, just for those who just joined us, uh, my name is Rusmin, and today I'll be hosting this uh, live webinar, and we have a special guest with us here today, uh, and his name is uh, Kenny. Okay, so uh, before I bring uh, Kenny's up, I would just want to turn on the webcam so at least you get to see me and Kenny sitting uh, side by side. So let me know if you can see the webcam. All right. So, yep. So I believe most of you should be able to see us. Yeah, just beside me is uh, Kenny, and uh, this is me, myself, uh, Rosmin. Hello. Okay, so uh, Kenny is actually a very good friend of mine, old friend of mine uh, since the uh, O-level days. And uh, we actually uh, met each other when we were still studying. And uh, back then, I think I was uh, very uh, impressed by Kenny, especially when he's, he himself actually uh, really interested in investing. Right? And I was, uh, back then when I was still young and naive, I was still uh, very interested in making quick money. And you know, when it, when it comes to making quick money, when it comes to investing, usually you end up with uh, forex trading, option trading. You know, those, those, there are still a lot of courses out there that still promise uh, quick returns, okay? Uh, but thankfully, I have friends like Kenny who actually reminded me that, you know, if I really want to build uh, money in a, in a sustainable manner over the long term, I should look up for this gentleman called Warren Buffett. You know, go and do a Google search and then read out about him and you should be able to see how he actually built his wealth, okay? So, like most of you should have known by now, Buffett actually built his wealth through uh, investing in the stock market alone, okay? So, he's been compounding his, uh, his uh, investment return at almost 20% a year. Okay, so that's when I actually got really interested in, in, in investing for a long term and I started to read up more about uh, Warren Buffett and that's where I started, started actually the whole journey and today I'm here, okay, so really thanks to you who <laughs> recommend me on uh, uh, long term investing uh, because really without you, I, I probably would not be who I am uh, doing what I'm doing here today, okay, so really thankful with uh, Kenny, okay, because he was the one basically inspired me to do uh, long term investing, okay, so after we finish our all level, and then we went separate path, okay? So we went on, he went on to pursue his own interests. I went on to do my aerospace electronics. And then for, I think, a period of a few years, uh, we didn't really keep in touch. Actually, he, he flew to US and he studied there and he actually spent a few years in US. And when he came back to Singapore, we actually started to in, uh, keep in touch again. And then that's where I actually found out that Kenny himself actually has been uh, uh, doing investing yourself. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and what actually... Uh, impressed me is that he actually managed a real fund okay and seven figure fund right all right so that fund itself actually generated a very good return uh, what is the exact percentage uh, that you did 15 percent 15 percent okay so that was actually very impressive uh and focusing mostly on the u.s market yes right? that's right yeah so you have your clients and then why you and after that he told me that he actually ended up uh, dissolving the fund. Okay, so what, what was the reason where you actually dissolved your fund? You know, your record is actually pretty good, you know, 15%. And uh, personally, I'm very happy if you can deliver me 10% a year. <laughs> so why did you uh, dissolve it when it was actually achieving a 15% a year? Well, I think that partly because like uh, initially when it happened, yeah. uh, we, we agreed on like having a long-term investment, long-term outlook. Yeah. But when yeah. in, in 2014 or 15, there was like a slight correction, people mm -hmm. start to worry panic yeah. and uh, after generating a good amount of returns people will you generally expect more say oh my friend is generating like 30 percent 40 percent and so on and so forth it's just like a another external factor so basically the clients that you manage is very important that mm -hmm. they have to align mm -hmm. have the same okay interest same so, vision so they kind of like have this uh, uh emotion called uh, envy yeah, and that's what Charlie Munger said, the most dangerous form of uh, emotion to have when it comes to investing, right? Yes. So you start right. to compare your result with others and then you realize that others are doing better than you, you know, and you sack your fund managers. And that's how a lot of dot, dot com bubble bursts. And a lot of fund managers actually uh, loses the money for their client because they started to switch into uh, growth stock during the dot com uh, crisis. Okay, so basically, uh, you've got the wrong clients, I expect. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> well, I think I think fifteen percent is very very impressive, and I'm really very happy if you can just deliver ten, twelve percent annualized a year. Okay, but I guess that is actually a blessing in disguise. 
and that's how it ended up coming back to Singapore. Yes, that's right. And then we rekindled our relationship <laughs> back, okay, for, for a few years. So, uh, and that's what, so basically, uh, tonight, uh, Kenny is going to uh, share with us how he managed the fund and what are the stocks that he actually invested and why he invested at that point of time. And he also will show us how to find those stocks, right? Yeah. That you yeah. actually bought for your portfolio back then. Okay. So, and along the way throughout this webinar, uh, if you have any questions for Kenny, right, and please feel free to ask on the chat box, just type your questions. And then towards the end of the presentation, we will uh, ans try to answer all of your questions. Okay. So, um, Kenny will first share with you how he started doing investing. So, I will leave everything to him. Okay. So, now I'll just switch back the uh, camera back to my slides. Okay. Can Kenny's slides actually. Okay. And you should be able to see his slides here. Okay. So, now uh, before Kenny start his presentations, then I will just uh, wait, let me pull out the slides first. Um, okay. So, here you go. Okay, all right. Uh, usual disclaimer apply. Whatever that he's gonna share with you, or I gonna share with you, you know, in tonight's webinar is only for educational purposes, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to make any decision, it's your own decision. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. Okay, so, okay, Kenny is your show now. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I guess Rusmin oversold me on the end, <laughs> but uh, it's very kind of him. It's good to meet him after a long time, but. It's very nice to meet you guys as well. So I just want to share with you a little bit about me, my journey, how I started, and also uh, the things that I've learned along the way, probably the mistakes I learned, the lessons I learned, and then I, hopefully you can apply that in your own uh, your own personal portfolio as well. So, uh, well, as I when, when I started, I actually uh, started in culinary arts. I actually studied at, uh, at Sunrise Culinary Academy. At the time, I was working at a French restaurant called uh, St. Julian down at the Fullerton Waterboat House. And then it was then that I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I guess, I guess because I love food, I think this is the natural uh, way part for me, right? You still love food. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. I still love food. So, I mean, who doesn't love good food, right? It's what, what, you li what I live for, actually. So, and during that time is when uh, one of my high school friends um, passed away. And then at that time, he just said about, you know, there are a lot of things he wanted to do. He has a lot of ambitions and goals. And I say, like, oh, what am I doing with my life? So, it's only then that when I, I really went to the bookstore, Kinokuniya and Taka, and I, I walked walk, walk, walk around and th then I realized that then I found this book called The, the Warren Buffett We Are. Say, I, I mean, I mean, this guy is great, right? And I, I think investing mm -hmm. is the easiest way. All you got to do, because at the time there was online brokerage already. So I thought, oh, you just invest money based on your judgment uh, and, and two clicks of a mouse, you can become a billionaire. But that, yeah. that, that was, that, that, that was <laughs> when I was young, right? As a na that was naive That's of me. That's how I started. Yeah, so then, uh, then moving on, like while, while I read the book, I, I get into like these four simple tenets, right? All you need to do is just find a business that you understand that has very good prospects going forward, managed by really, really good people. And of course, uh, that's financially strong. And of course, you have to, any securities that you buy, you have to buy it at the right price, right? Price uh, price is what you pay, value is what you get, right? Out of it, that's what, what Warren Buffett said. So I highly recommend you, if you guys want to know more about investing, to get this book and you can basically use this as your guideline, as your checklist, some yeah. sort of a checklist. checklist. Right. When I look at it now, it exactly look at the same mental flow that we usually look at uh, companies before we make our decision, yeah. Yeah, so uh, then after that, like, um, after my culinary school, so I decided to go to US because I guess where there, there was where Warren Buffett came from, right? Yeah. So I just decided, oh, maybe you know, I get to know more of the US stock market, the way how the how the, how how they teach us like investing over there. So, so you moved to Omaha? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, actually not. Actually, I, I went to California, so oh, I, okay. I I studied for two years, and after that, uh, I I managed to get a scholarship. So then I, I went to Drexel University. So I, I was mm. thinking like, why pay more for college, right? Yeah, like it doesn't make sense. So I think whatever you learn is roughly. Uh, the same yeah yeah mm -hmm. so then after I graduated I actually went on to uh, applied materials I actually worked at a corp, corp, as a corporate okay. financial analyst for a year applied material is a semicon company yeah semiconductor so they have an office here in Singapore Changi uh, and mm -hmm. I, I work in the 
their US branch basically in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I worked there for a while and then uh, I, I didn't manage to get a visa to stay, stay on over there. Mm, okay. So then uh, also during uh, that time, I was also manage, manage, managing a, an offshore fund over there. So it was actually a small fund. And then like uh, Rusmin mentioned, right? So I think this would be a great segue to, to, to my to the next section, right? Yeah. Like, like Rusmin mentioned, it's all, all about emotions. I think a lot of times it was hard for me when I was managing funds because at the time when things were not doing well, yeah. I have to manage my own emotions and on top of that, I have to manage, manage my clients', clients emotions, emotions yeah. and expectations. So they wanted more, they wanted to leverage, they wanted, you know, <laughs> a whole lot more things, you know? I mean, it's good yeah. to have more, but at some point it's not enough. So sometimes you have to uh, risk safety to get that extra return, which I, I don't agree. So I think it's better for me to uh, return the capital because I think I'll be happier that way. I think. Yeah, actually yeah. that's the right thing to do. So basically the main difference between being a fund managers versus a retail investor, retail investors actually have advantage because they don't have to answer to anyone, right? Except themselves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because as a fund managers, you have to manage your clients, expectation, emotion, and you also manage, have to, you're already busy managing your own emotion, you still have to manage other people's expectation, emotion. That is quite tough, actually. Yes, that's yeah. right. It's, it's very difficult. It's uh, one of the difficult things to do. But right, since since we're here, I think like I would like to mm -hmm. share with you how you could manage your emotions. Yeah, right? that's actually very good uh, advice. Yeah. Uh, and it applies to anyone who, who invests in the stock market. Yes. Yeah. When it comes to the subject of investing, right, the, the thing is you have to invest when you have excess it's not invest what you need mm, okay. so the first thing that you need to be is financially stable yeah. make sure you have some sort of emergency fund that's what i tell all my friends and family who are into investing mm -hmm. have six months to a year you never know what's going to happen and um it, just in just in case that you know you lost your job or you anything that's going on you have something to uh to lie on or like have a temporary fund which could tie you through like six months to a year yeah. until you find the next opportunity that, that it comes so along. Anything can happen, right? Yes. In case. And at the same time, you have to make sure that your loved one is protected. You usually are distracted when you say our loved one is not feeling well or, or, or fall ill or some sort and you, you're financially strained because of that. So that's why it's important that you get your medical insurance for the people around you and the people around you and they are well protected. And we after that, is where there's a green light. Do you notice that number one is red, then after that, number two is mm, yellow. It's okay. almost like the traffic light. Yeah. And number three is green. And that's where you can really take that money and invest, mm, uh, okay. right? And, and grow your money. So the next thing that I want to, to say is having the right expectation based on your lifestyle. A lot of, want, a lot of people want to have a quick return. They, they want to be like a mm. trader every night, trade, trade. But the thing is you have a full-time job, nine, nine to five, sometimes to 10 o'clock, you have to have, to stay up all night yeah. just to wait for the New York Stock Exchange to open to trade until 4 a.m. in the morning. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I mean, to some people, it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. I'm not saying like value investing is better than uh, trading, right? I'm saying either way you can make money, but it's just that it's not my style. And although at the same time, trading, you want to be a trader, you have to have that personality of a trader, yeah. right? And yeah. there's a lot of technical analysis going through and you really, really have to uh, manage your emotions very well. When you lose money, you just, you, you won't feel anything. You just say, oh, it's just a mistake. It's just yeah. won't happen. Yeah. And what I didn't like about it is because as a trader, you know, sometimes they say trader lose 60% of the time. And then sometimes when, you know, the chart, the technical analysis, even though everything is right, it's, everything is in place, sometimes it might not even come true. You know, it might not even follow through. And I don't like that idea. But as a value investor, I know that, oh, the numbers are backed by the fundamentals of the company which mm. is a sound way of thinking. And I know, oh, even the price drop, it could be an opportunity because I know the business. Yeah. yeah. And also one thing that if I want to share with you uh, right here is be consistent. If you're a value investor, be a value investor. Don't don't be a value investor and halfway and say, oh, when the price drop, I changed my mind, I become a trader. <laughs> and that's where things get a bit yeah. messy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I've seen people mix in like where, where they enter stocks based on like uh, uh, all those uh, fun, uh, technical analysis they enter and exit yeah maybe i could just give a quick analogy on sports okay so if i look at value investing right because it's long term slow and steady yeah. it's as good as uh, playing a golf yeah right and when i look at traders everything moves so fast and everything is so short every every score counts it, it, as if like you're playing a basketball yes. right and everything moves so fast right so it's totally different different uh, game altogether you can't just mix these two around so you're going to have a lot of conflicting uh, signals 
and rules. Yes. Right? So stick to what you're good at and then just just play with by, by, by what you're good at. Right? Yes. And the, the next point that I want to point to is have the right expectation based on your skill level. So, for example, if uh, if you're new to investing, I will recommend you to cover mostly the big and well-known companies because th those are the businesses that you understand. Mm -hmm. You know what affects the business. For example, if you look at Coca-Cola, what affects the business? Probably sugar prices, water, which mm -hmm. is important. Yeah, it's a few simple things. Just looking at it, you don't really have to look into the annual report to know that they need water or sugar to create the product, mm. right? And another thing is also um, situational. This one is where Warren Buffett used to generate like 50% returns, yeah. right, in the past. And situation in the past was easy because there was information wasn't that easily available. Okay. So some people get partial information. So as long as you're hard, hard working, you dig through the pages. Remember, Warren Buffett dig through uh, thousands of uh, pages of Moody's uh, manuals. That's where he find his opportunities. Yeah. That will happen then. But now it's, it's actually a, a lot harder because yeah. there's a lot of screeners. There are a lot of people looking, uh, sophisticated investors uh, or in the financial yeah. institutions or hedge funds that are looking at the same set of companies that you're yeah. looking at. Everybody, I mean, all the institutional investors all use Bloomberg. So yeah. Right <laughs> kind of information. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and also at the same time, uh, right expectation. Sometimes it's like you need to have the right expectation because when you invest in a certain company at the, based on your conservative projection of how the company will do in the next five to 10 years, mm -hmm. you need to ex have the right expectation of return. So for example, if you put in $10,000 and you need to expect that the return will be like around 10 to 12%, you know, like have yeah. a healthy expectation of return, not like 30, 40, 50% of returns. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you want to have more returns in terms of the dollar amount, you, yeah. should, you should expect to put in more amount of capital to generate uh, that amount of money right yeah, yeah. instead but some people have the the misconception or or, or, or make the mistake of saying like oh I put ten thousand dollars I'm gonna make twenty thousand dollars they want to make hundred percent overnight or two hundred percent overnight and when when that thinking comes to you you start to do things that are irrational or you just take more risks or people start to invest in Bitcoin because they are looking at things that can double their money quickly overnight but once you're too greedy, you start to move away from the safety. You know, you start to take more risks. You know, you start to it things start to become very dangerous, and you become emotional about it. Very emotional yeah, about it. Yeah. So that that's one of the dangerous things. That's why, that's why it's important when you ha you have a list of companies. Like you don't have to invest now, and you don't need to know all the companies. Right now, there's about what seven thousand five hundred companies in a list of companies around in the in the in three the, stock exchange, right? In the US. In the US right now. So but the thing is you don't don't need to know everything. Maybe uh, a good company is you only get like two hundred good companies and out of the two hundred you might know like twenty or thirty. And that's all you all, all you need to know at, at and when you have a list of those, and what, once you wait for the opportunity, once it appears, and that's when you invest. Because you're investing for long term, you want to wait for the right opportunity. It's almost like you're finding a wife, right? You have to you, <laughs> you, want, you have to wait for the right opportunity, the right person, and you enter. And over the long term, life will be very good, right? Happy wife, happy life. So, right? So, long term investing is like uh, finding a wife. Yeah, like finding a partner. Trading is like having a one night stand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe you can say, say so. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I want night stand so but anyways you, you want to build something that's sustainable over the long term because i don't like the idea that uh you know trading you know once you make money ten thousand twenty thousand sometimes you you mistaken uh luck for skill yeah and then you start to bet heavier and heavier and all it takes is just that one mistake and you're, you're back to square one again yeah. uh, it, that's if you do not know how to manage risk uh mm. properly so another thing is to be really patient and wait to make money for example some people probably get a uh, entered a certain uh, stocks, right? Yeah. Entered, started a few positions earlier on and maybe now there's like a, some sort of a correction. Mm. But it, it, as long as it's the right price, you don't really have to worry what happens in the near term. It's more, more like, will you get uh, what you expected to get in the future based on the price that you're getting? And mm. when you're happy with that 10 and 12%, why would you worry about short-term fluctuations, right? Yeah. One example is in the three-month chart uh, leading up to this, you can see it's just, you know, up and down. You don't know yeah, where it goes. It's very, very volatile. Very volatile, right? Six months to six months. If your time frame is between three, three to six months, you can expect things to go, not go anywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. you might be depressed, or you might be, you might lose hope. Oh, I can't believe it. I put my money ten thousand dollar. Until uh, six months later, it's still ten thousand dollar, or even less Lower. than ten thousand yes. dollars. So you yeah. might be depressed. But the thing is, you should focus on the fundamentals on the company. Whether yeah, the earnings is growing year over year, 
rather than the price. Mm -hmm. So on a two year chart, you can start to see the difference, you know, mm -hmm. over the long term, because companies usually in the S&P 500, that means they, they usually remove those uh, failing under companies, yeah. under underperformed com companies out and put in the companies that are performing, uh, that, that fulfills the, character, uh, the criteria. criteria. So mm -hmm. indirectly, they are managing uh, some sort of a fund for you, mm -hmm. right, of, of 500 of the best companies in the US. Uh, and fire you can chart. see fire chart over the long term is always on the rise, right? Yeah. Next time, if you, if you were to zoom out even further, right, can you take wow. a look mm. here in 2008, Sometimes you can't even spot to down it, but if you can look at the uh, specific moment, right? 70, 173, there's a huge drop, but eventually, even if you, if you stretch it until today, the chart is basically on the uptrend. Yeah, on the uptrend. Yeah. Well, you, if you can see 2000, 2007, everything, we write through everything and, and we do very well. I remember Rusmin was telling me uh, not long ago, like that time when I came back, he said, if you invest in the worst possible time in the S&P 500, remember, oh, the yeah. worst possible time, and they say, guess what, what, what is the rate of return? I said, oh, I'm not sure, maybe 5%. Then he told me like 8%, oh, 8% is good. So in the yeah, worst possible, so right before it crash, at the peak, you invest, you make 8% year over year. Oh, but of course, yeah. this is over the long term. Uh. So that's why if you invest, imagine like your salary man, you're starting out, you want to invest 10,000 every year, so you put 10,000, so you start with 10,000 and every year you add 10,000 for 10 years, for 8% yeah, will be 166,000, right? Yeah. And then for 10%, which I think is quite is achievable because the S&P returns generally, uh, the ETFs returns about 10% uh, historical, just like a benchmark return for most companies. So you can get about 1.8 1, 1, 1. times your money in 10 years and, uh, uh, and about three times uh, for for 20 years right yeah. which is not too bad so that's why if you want if you want more returns you should expect to invest more instead of generate more money by taking more risks mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's that's what i uh i have for you and managing so aside from that you need to learn to manage your risk through portfolio management and i think that's one of the ways that you could uh manage your emotions so yeah. why are people you, emotional because they do not know themselves you know in the beginning when i read a lot of investment books they say oh you don't have to be emotional and everything but i don't know i do not really know what it means until i put my heart in heart and money, money in. Yes, yeah. yeah and you invest and you drop 10 percent, 15 percent, and you're like oh there's this empty heavy feeling in in, in, in your chest right yeah. that you feel and then that's where you know yourself that's why i think um i was uh talking uh speaking to victor the other day I was, I was thinking about like you know you need to uh it takes time for you to uh, mature emotionally, right? Yeah. You, you need to go through the cycles yes. using real money, right? Yes, using real money. That's why paper money usually it doesn't work. It's because uh, you do, you're not emotionally tied to your money because we, we take so much time, we put in so much blood and sweat to make the money and yeah. to lose it in that in that one or two days of investment, it just hurts a lot. And yeah, yeah. and sometimes you want to chase more returns because you lose it. So. The thing is, risk doesn't come from volatility. This is what this is what I thought about the, uh, when I was creating a slide. It's how you react to volatility that's risky. Sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. ups and downs when you're losing money and you start to fear, panic, and you start to sell, and that's what dangerous. But however, volatility also gives, uh, brings opportunity for you because mm -hmm. once if you're intelligent, uh, if you know what the business is all about, uh, and you know that this is an opportunity, is something that's temporary. That's where the opportunity comes, and you have to take advantage of it. So when I when I, what I feel is this every time when I invest something invest in something uh, I get more conviction uh, when I feel fear a bit of fear because uh, naturally right you feel the yes, drop right yes, yes. I feel fear oh that means that there's some something there I need to check whether it's true or not like you know whether yeah. the opportunity is there or not and you are human yeah and I'm human so it's very <laughs> natural so it's it's not really totally in eliminating fear but managing your yeah, risks and yes. emotions this is a very nice quote I think you might want to screenshot <laughs> <laughs> it's really a nice quote. yeah it sums up very well so it's good if you can keep that in mind so this is generally how I manage my risk, how I diversify my portfolio. So first is I usually put 80% into value growth. So for me is uh, because I've already spent so much time and I, I tried many ways mm -hmm. of allocating my portfolio. I think this is what works for me. I feel like if I were to uh, find opportunities, they don't come very often. Yep. And then once I find them, I, I was try to concentrate my my capital in, in them. Uh. So that's what I do, five to 10%, depending on the certainty and the price. Uh, 
price that I got it. Yeah. And you have no hurry, right, to deploy a capital? Yes, no hurry. So it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be set in stone. But generally, yeah. overall, this is how I look, how it will look. And also, if I were to do situational like things that I'm new new to stocks that I'm new to and I'm not that confident, I'll probably put a small weightage. So even eventually, if I I lose money, it will mm -hmm. not hurt me that much. Maybe if I lose fifty percent, there'll be one percent on my total portfolio. Yeah. So th there won't be much. So situational will be like twenty percent. And of course, all these things, like I say, it's not set in stone. Sometimes they are not a lot situational. Uh -huh. So I'll, most of my money will be in in value growth stocks, and mm -hmm. it depends on the on the what's available. So for novice or investors who fear volatility, what I recommend you is to uh, diversify uh, between 10 to 20 stocks. But in the, in the beginning, I, I think I, I won't recommend you to do so many because the thing is, it's almost like having stock is almost like having kids. You know, if you have too many of them, it's very hard to keep track, <laughs> <laughs> you okay. know, uh, like how to keep track, who, who likes what, their personality and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Maybe you can start by investing half of your portfolio like, or whatever capital that you wanted to invest. Yeah. And just start with five percent each, or maybe for five to six stocks. So just to have a feel, like how when stocks, when you invest at certain price, when it start to decline, how are you feeling? Mm. Why are you feeling that way? Uh, yeah. So and also at, at the same time, before you invest in any stocks, I would highly recommend you to take a piece of paper and and write. Okay, I'm buying these stocks. How many shares? Because of what? What's the reason? Very and, simple reason. Yeah, structural reason. What are the risks associated with with this? And if it, it doesn't work out, if this risk were to uh, materialize or things were to happen, uh, I think I'll, I'll probably sell this this yeah. stock. You know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So at least you know. You know you help you hold yourself accountable for the things that you're doing. Then invest. Investors who seek comfort in having a steady income. I know some people, you know, they, they like to see money coming in. That's why I think generally people like to uh, invest in real estate because it's physical and yeah. every month you have a rental income, income coming in. in. So if you're one of those people and you also want to make a, a above average return, I highly recommend you to um, not, I mean, higher rentage on dividend stocks. Dividend stocks uh. So it, if, it doesn't have to be 50%, but it depends on you, how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. You just get a few good steady dividend stocks. So if, even in times of crisis, these dividend stocks, they could pay you steady returns. And that's where you you, you feel comfort. You say, oh, I, have, I still have that 6% coming in out of the 50%. And you wouldn't bother about the next 50% that you deploy uh, for capital appreciation, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have money coming in. So that's one way to manage your emotions. Uh, so this, will, yeah these are some of the three questions that already sent in uh, before we have this live webinar so i think uh, the questions also suits very well so actually kenny sorted some of the questions that have been asked and then he'll try to answer since we are in this topic of uh, managing a portfolio right yes yeah so uh jonathan asked uh understand it is not possible to time the market but with current sentiments so negative when the stock hit your target price would you buy or continue to wait uh, for even lower price. So I would say that it's not an exact science, but once it hits your target price and you realize that based on this price, assuming that five years from now, three to five years from now, you can make an annualized return on uh, of like 10 to 12 percent, depending on what your target is, yeah. right? Uh, 10, 10 to 12 percent. And then you think how likely are you, how likely is the company uh, be able to get there based on this price you pay? If you're, if you're uncertain, you probably will buy at a, a slight discount to intrinsic value mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you you give a buffer just in case it won't hit so if you buy at a low price it most likely will fall in the range of 10 to 12 percent yeah. and yeah. of that sort so um, and of course uh, like you when, when it hits your target price you think that you you'll get you that price so maybe you want to put in like 50 percent of your capital and maybe average down as it goes lower yeah I think that would be the yeah. the best way so if you have any other question, of course, you can type in in your chat box now. Uh, we will answer some of them. I think Kenny still have uh, other topics to talk about, so we will come back later towards the end of his presentation. Okay. So if you already bought your stock, okay, this I, I mentioned before, so will you ever reach down? Yes. Any guru fo follow when you come to averaging down? No. I think as long as you're comfortable with the valuation or if not, Sometimes some people have a rule that, oh, okay, from the target price, if we drop 5%, they allocate another 10% or another 5% another five again, they allocate another 10%. So it depends on how how you manage it. Like I say, if you're happy with the price you pay, uh, it doesn't matter whether you average down or not. But yeah, it's, 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 it's a matter of choice. I would say it's a matter of choice. Yeah, yeah. personal preference. If you're following a strict portfolio allocation, wouldn't 
average down, disrupt that allocation and cost overweight on few particular stocks that you did averaging down? How do we address this? I think the weightage doesn't, the weightage matters, but it doesn't really matter that much because you shouldn't focus. When a stock continues to do well, doesn't mean that you should just trim your position. If I have a stock like Berkshire Hathaway in the early years, if I were to be able to invest in that company, I don't think when it goes up, I will trim my position. I'll just let it go. Right. Yeah, uh, unless 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 you think it's overvalued, you can trim it back and probably add it when it's be at or below intrinsic value. If you have such, some sort of strategy to do that, but if not, if you just uh, you know, you just you just you have your work, you have a lot of things going on. As as long as you invest in something safe, usually I I will not even look at it. I maybe take a look at it every week or every month at the end of every month. But it's only those situational stocks that I will look closely. Yeah. And I will not overweight on, on, on them. So that's how you manage your risk. Yeah. yeah. So the question is a bit uh, generic. Uh, so that's why it has to depend on uh, the companies that you're actually investing in. So if your your strategy is uh, more on like, you know, looking at companies that is growing, compounded, basically those companies can continue keep on growing and growing and growing. I think even if you reach overvaluation, it, it doesn't make sense to sell, right? Yes. Yeah, because uh, even Kenny, I think he's going to share with you some of his uh, past mistakes that after you sold, share price continue to run. Yeah. Uh, or even for me and myself, uh, those good companies that I sold uh, at a good valuation, uh, basically a high valuation, later part I realized that I actually uh, being a fool to sold the company. <laughs> yeah. So if you're buying a cigarette stocks, and then I think uh, then of course you might want to sell when you reach uh, fair, fair value. value right? Yes, that's so, right. I think mean, we, we both of us uh, learned this the hard way. I mean, he has he learned this in the U.S. market. I learned this in the Asia market, and he, we came to the same conclusion. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So we 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 will okay. Maybe we we, we will continue, to... and I'll share with yeah. you the companies I've invested. And of course, this is not all because we we don't have a lot of time to yeah. cover all of them. But um, so generally, the first company uh, company that, stock tips. Yeah, stock tips. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> these are the. Uh, Past case studies. Past case studies, yeah. And these are all based on past, and then today's could have changed. So you might want to uh, go and do your own research, you know, before. Looking. Yes, do not follow blindly, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Anyways, uh, the company that I invested in in the past, back and then, uh, back yeah. then uh, it was a mistake that I made about. Uh, I, I definitely want to share with you why I thought uh, at the time this was a good investment and then why it didn't turn out. So this is a basically a generic pharmaceutical company in the US. They 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 are one of the companies that has a license to pr uh, produce this opioid based uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient. So basically, it helps. Uh, it's almost like a, almost like a morphine thing. It's yeah. like from, it's created from poppy seeds. So then it's it's a, you're able to um, how say it's almost like a painkiller basically painkiller painkiller sort of okay. things. And of course, they also they have a. Um, a contract with Jerome Stevens Pharmaceutical to to produce this uh, drug which uh, treats uh, hyperthyroidism. Uh, yeah. So it helps mm -hmm. um, create uh, produce that kind of hormones that people generally lack for mental and physical development. Yeah. So I think okay, you know, you, every day you constantly have to take this drug, so it's more of a recurring income sort of a business. So I yeah. think probably it's good business, right? Drug mm -hmm. business, people need it. Um, and at the time, Valen Pharmaceutical was raising uh, drug prices aggressively. And then uh, during the election, Hillary Clinton and uh, all the political election, they, they took notice of it. And they, they, they were, there, were, there was a lot of talks about regulating uh, the drug price increase mm, uh, at mm. that point in time. So, and that's when you decided to buy. Yeah, yeah when I decided to buy. Yeah. buy. So when I decided to sell, it's because uh, they start to take on massive debt for an acquisition. And after that acquisition happened, uh, they lost uh, a customer. They happened to lo lose uh, lose a customer that's, uh, that's generally 40% 40, 40 of the EBITDA, basically mm. earning wow. before interest tax and wow, depreciation. that's a huge chunk. Yeah, and then when, when you lose uh, such a huge customer, means you probably over overpaid yes, really overpaid yes, for yeah. the asset right so this is what happened right so i bought at uh, around uh, six yeah okay. mid, mid 2014 at 46 and then after that uh after the announcement i think oh it's a it's a good way because all of these uh pharmaceutical companies right mm. they got beaten down because of stock prices i think oh they took the they took the chance to consolidate to buy buy out competitors right so when drug prices were to increase and uh, probably the valuation will start to increase again 
And they lost, then after that, they announced in November that they lost a major customer and stock start to, uh, stock came down there. I realized, okay, th this doesn't make sense. Eventually, they will have to service a higher debt with lower revenue mm. and it doesn't make sense. So eventually, it will be valued at a lower uh, valuation. So eventually, it came down. So I sold at $34.38. 30, so I, I lost about 26%, 26% on that. And overall, so what I want to say is, I lost about twenty six percent, right? Yeah. And but but if you were to hold it under today, you lose eighty seven percent. Thankfully, you so yeah. Thankfully, <laughs> I saw. But at the same time, this is this was. I, can you imagine this was my situational type of investment? So I if I were to have, or I were to invest heavily, right? Something were, were to happen, yeah. I would have. I lost a great chunk of uh right. my my investors' money, which is not very good. So this is one of the ways that I I, I start to get to know about. Uh, portfolio a portfolio management and start to get to know a new industry so that's yeah. a, i venture out of my circle i would say Compet circle of competence right mm -hmm. i want to broaden my circle of competence but this just didn't turn out right and at the same time you realize that later on i'll showcase a couple more companies but over the long term right um right uh, time is a good business it, it's a good friend of a good business, good business right yes. and, and, and it's a bad uh it's, it's a bad trend of a of a bad business, business right? Yeah, because it, mediocre business. Mediocre business. Yeah. Uh, because over a long time, pharmaceutical is a very difficult business, right? Especially, you know, you need to have blockbuster drugs in the pipeline, and you need to constantly have something coming on to make uh make more revenue going forward to power on the revenue. Yeah. So it's a very difficult business. So so is 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 we actually have a question coming in, and uh, do you how do you analyze the pharmaceutical companies? Because he personally, uh, children personally find it hard to to analyze because it's such a complicated business. Oh, children. Yeah. So yeah. I guess this is how you ended up with a two percent location. <laughs> yeah, two percent. To to be honest, <laughs> I, I will not pay attention to uh pharmaceutical companies because all these companies, all these drugs, right? They have expiry, different expiry, so right. pat patents expiry. So some of these uh companies, right? Uh, it takes 20 years to develop a drug, oh uh, a drug, and also because they fear that people once they will, they pass the first uh, first FDA approval, that other companies will will copy them. So they actually patent it right even before they start the mm. drug testing trial. So then maybe by the time they finish drug testing, it'll be five to six years. They have invested a lot of money, and doesn't mean that at the end of it it will work out. So mm. that's why all these drug pri drug price. It, uh, drug, drugs right are actually very expensive because a lot of research Money a lot of capital has been spent yeah. and the thing is unless it's very specific in certain areas and you understand the drugs and you know why certain drugs is better than the other why people will pay more for uh for for certain drugs then or probably you can invest in the pharmaceutical companies but for people like me i am I'm, I'm not sure and even like there are a lot of drug names mm. so names that i have to study and actually uh, it's very difficult for me to follow uh, this industry specifically. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's kind of like too complicated. Yes, yeah. yes, too hard, I would say. Uh, so another company, so I say like, you don't really have to focus on companies that, you know, are obscure, especially if you're a beginner, I would, I would highly recommend you to follow companies that you understand and mm -hmm. start from there, yeah. at least know it inside out so for example mastercard is a payment processing company right i'm sure you know they make money based, uh, make a cut of uh, fees when you swipe your credit cards and transfer when they transfer money from place to place and then convert currency for you when you travel overseas when you yeah. spend yeah so that's how they make money simply and that time i bought because there was an opportunity mastercard actually uh increased about 49 percent the previous year it was they did very well and of course then the time there was facebook google amazon they come in and they, they introduced something called mobile payments and people at the time who didn't understand uh the business people thought like oh mobile payments or oh, maybe they're going to disrupt and they're going to bypass mastercard and visa mm -hmm. so both of these uh companies took a hit visa so, and master yeah, Visa and Master took it. So, uh, so it was in 2013. It was about uh, I think 90 dollars. I think it came down to 70 dollars. Oh, 70 dollars. Then I was like, oh, this is a great company. And usually companies like that that generates a strong cash flow has a strong moat. Uh, it's it's very rare that they trade below like 20 times or, or 15 times earnings. So, but at, at, at this price was a good buy for me. And I sold. Yeah, especially you've been swapping your cards. Yes. On the Cyber Monday <laughs> and the Black. Yes. The, the funny thing about this is once once I bought Mastercard, I, I start to look at the cards in my my wallet, and I said, oh, and I, use I, that card I, I always use Mastercard. <laughs> I started using using Mastercard yeah. more. So 
So the thing is, it doesn't make sense because I understand the business. So that's why I say all these things, like there are a lot of misunderstandings that that, that, that happen in the market. People misunderstood. They react first before they, they actually find out what's going yeah. on. So when they react first, that's a good opportunity for you to to, to buy. And then after that, I then I sold it at $103. This is the part where I started to, to wind down the, the fund. So I, I, I need to exit before uh, 2016. So I sold around December, mid-December. So you, be, you sold because you are dissolving the fund? Yes. And then you see, uh, okay, it, it was a good return. It's, it's not too bad. And uh, if you were to hold long term, what, what I'm trying to prove my point is if you buy a good company and you hold long term, even you buy it at a fair price, it, it actually will do you well over the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I learned this the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> you, your client will be happy if they, you hold it until today. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm sure this is your call, right? Yes. Your call, so that, that's why I think all you got to do is wait, find the right opportunity, the right yeah, time, yeah. buy, and then just close your eyes. Really, not. But of course, it doesn't mean close your eyes. It means don't, not, not, <laughs> not to check it. back. Don't, don't review your stock portfolio and everything. At least once a year. Once a year, follow the annual report, follow the quarterly earnings, see what's going on, understand the business. So when there's another opportunity that comes, right? There's another thing that happened, right? You, you, you right away on the top of your head. Okay, I know this mm. is an opportunity. It's a good time to buy, right? So, oh my God, oh, happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was Google. I think I'm sure all of you know Google, right? Google basically is the largest online uh, advertising company. I don't have to explain further with this. Yeah. And of course, this it, it tumbled because uh, Facebook was gaining ground, right? They're gaining mm. market share and Google also lost out in the mobile market share, uh, declining from about 40, 7% to 40%. So I think people fear that, oh, it might overtake Google. But Facebook might overtake Google. Yeah, Facebook yeah. might overtake Google. So because that was the hottest thing then. Mm. But I asked myself, so uh, what is Facebook? Facebook is just a, a social social platform, right? You, yeah. you go there, talk to your friends and everything. So so the thing is, both are really different. So what is, what is life without Google? No internet. No search, right? No search, no, oh, search, no internet, live, right? Can't live without Google. Yeah, so I think it will not go away. I think they'll continue to make ads. And also at the same time, I realized that eventually more and more people will gravitate towards e-commerce, online, Amazon was up and coming. So as more and more go into that space, people will start to uh, advertise more in that space because newspaper is no longer uh, a very popular platform to advertise or TV because people are cutting cables then, right? Slowly, slowly cutting cables. Mm -hmm. So they're not watching TV as much. So that's where I think the opportunity came. So I, I, and when it went, when it, it went down, it went to five hundred and twenty-two dollars, yes. right? And then at the same time, of course, I sold because I have to wind down. So, I, uh, holy cow! If you keep it under today, it will almost double, more yeah. than double. Oh yeah, that's right. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's about yeah. If you get a very good return over over the long run. But the thing is, what I say is, when it comes to Google, right, it's something that you can clearly understand, right? Yes, so yes. if there's if Yahoo is were to make a comeback, you understand because yeah. at first maybe or maybe a new search engine were to come on, and then you realize, oh ha, huh, this must be a joke, a new search engine. How can they compete with Google? Then a couple months later, you might be like, um. You find yourself using that search engine, you know yeah. that something is wrong, right? Yes, yes. So you're on the ground with with this kind of technology, but but at least for the foreseeable future, maybe one to two years, you know that Google is here to stay, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They have the best people, they have the cash to to hire the best within best engineers to to innovate and create. Yeah. So another company that I I invested, I invested and I like is actually uh Chow Shua. Mm -hmm. Uh so at the time there was a Oil crash. This has nothing to do with Chow Shot, basically. It's just that oil came down from 115 to 35 dollars. Everybody's afraid, right? The yeah. sentiment is negative in the market. So I think this is a good chance to buy. I've been looking at Chow Shot for one or two two years at the other time, and I love the business model because um, they they are basically generating money through their brokerage firm. But right now, it's not no longer through brokerage, right? Yeah. Right now, it's for uh, their through their asset management firm. So they generate a fee from that. Yeah. Right at the same time, they take whatever cash that's left over. They will invest in like bonds, uh, short-term bonds to generate uh capital, basically generate mm -hmm. a return. Yeah. So over long term, in a price increase environment, right, uh, in a rate rate rising environment, Chow Shop will definitely benefit. will benefit from it. So, so I bought when it actually came down from thirty thirty over dollars to about twenty seven dollars. I think that was a good opportunity mm -hmm. because. Uh, Charles Schwab, basically their asset, right? The value of the asset will fluctuate based on the market. Yeah. So I think when it goes down, it, it tends to be a bit uh, volatile in terms of their their, their prices. Yes, so yes. I understand that the behavior of the stock price, but doesn't mean that I time the market. Mm -hmm. So then I just find the right opportunity. I bought it, and it. Uh, by the way, it's not right. You see, can can you see the stock? I, I actually bought it 
on and the then, way down. Yeah, Actually, okay. I lost. Uh, I lost some. Uh, I made some paper loss. So if you're very the emotional, beginning. then you'll be like very depressed. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. You know, chance yeah. so it's not a good start. Yeah. And then you have this kind of uh, hallucination coming in, trying to tell you to sell, right? Yeah, you feel bad and everything. You know, okay, okay, I feel bad. I said, oh, I could have bought, but okay, it's fine. I, I just turn off the screen. I just walk away. I do something else. But then after that, um, I I, I sold it at uh, like around. Hey, in fact, I think $30. one year later, you were still under the water. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that was only two years later. You started to see your return. Actually, the, the, the way I, I deal with this is I go back to the annual report. Okay, asset going up. Okay, yeah. earnings going up. Okay, yeah, it's good. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I focus on. And then today, it's today you call it, it's uh, 62%. Oh, what a pity, man. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. It's good return. But the thing is, all yeah. these things, like, I don't expect high returns. I expect, like, as long as I can yes. get 12, 15, it's good. But I, I also know that these companies are usually high growth, uh, not not as capital intensive type of company. Mm-hmm. So cash flow generative company, actually that's what I look for. Yeah. But yeah, you didn't lose money. I think that's the most important uh, rules when it comes to investing in stock market. Yes, I think focus yeah. on protecting your loss because the thing is you want to, your goal with investing is to eventually retire or learn, enjoy your life later, yes. have some sort of passive income that, that's coming in. So that, that's why you need to learn to, to protect your money and grow it sustainably over the long term. If you can get 10% year over year, over 10, 20 years, it's better than, you know, having make 50% one, two years, then after that lose, lose 20, 30, 50 yeah. uh, in the following years. So yeah, you have to be prudent with your money and manage your emotions. That's my message to you. And in- yeah. so those were the, some of the stocks that you invested yes. uh, back then. Okay, so now you are going to show us your secret no, no, this is no secret. <laughs> so, so the thing is, uh, I, uh, because of this question, right? Uh, Mansing, oh, Mansing, yeah, Mansing asked, uh, US got too many stocks that retail investors like us not even heard of. So I, I'm, I addressed this question early on. Like mm. you don't really have to look for obscure stocks in the beginning, but understand the, the big, big companies. Then eventually, once your skill, once your skill and confidence improve, and that's where you dig for the obscure stocks, yeah. right? Mm. And then uh, what's the most effective uh, method of screening, basically to filter all these companies, right? So in the US, right, um, I think one of the best way to screen, generally to a s- screen, this is not like a, a something that you should follow. It's not like the 10 commandments, you know? Yeah. 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 So then four, you can, one, one is it has to have a consistent revenue growth over the past 10 years, five to 10 years at least, five to 10 years have a good track record. Mm-hmm. Earnings, they're also making profitability. Uh, they're also profiting year after year. This also shows that you're not really investing in a company that's cyclical or that's uh, subjected to any uh, economic downturn, uh, some sort, more of a defensive and growing stock. Mm, regardless of the time. Yes, and then it has a good general return on equity because you're an equity holder, you, you expect a return, right, over yeah, the long run. Yeah. So uh, at least 15% and has a current ratio of at least two. Uh, of, course, of course, this is not set in stone because some companies, they can actually trade lower like Walmart or so. Because Coca-Cola one time. One time yeah. earning because they always have cash up front. Cash is always paid yeah, to them first. Yeah. So then at least in the short term, you know that they are sovereign. And then in the long term, you also know that uh, yeah. They are managed, managed. They are financing their their balance sheet conservatively, right? Not yeah. with not with a lot of debt, overburden with debt. So, so another thing I want to say is, a lot of times people take a lot of debt in in terms of uh, oil companies, right? In good times, they make a lot of money, but when their revenue start to dec- decrease, right? They they are not able to service the interest uh, from that large amount of debt they took on, and that's where most of the companies get in trouble. Mm. So that, that's the issue. That's why companies like probably like the local telecoms or some sort, they have consistent earnings. They can they can level their their balance sheet, and people are still willing uh, people are still willing to lend to them because they know that their earnings are consistent. Good times, bad times, people will still use their phone, mm. right? Mm. Pay their phone bills. So I I recommend this is like a free software for you to use a uh, free website that you can use to screen the stocks, right? So finviz.com. And in here, like I say, I screen based on uh, my criteria. This is a brief screen. So out of 7,500 stocks, right? Briefly screening all these down by long-term debt over equity, current ratio, uh, sales growth over the past five years, mm-hmm. return on equity of 15%, that's, I get about 177 stocks. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And from there, you can pull through, okay, some things I not I, I might not understand, semiconductor, maybe I do not know. Then you just dig through one by one and see, look at their financials. So this is more for US stocks? Yeah, screening for US stocks. How about Asia? Is that, is that a good uh, soft filter to use? Asia, probably not not, not, not that comprehensive. Not, 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 yeah, not that comprehensive. So you should, you should go to things. Uh, and also, if you want to look at their financials, uh, you can either go to Morningstar, 
-hmm. or you can go to Guru Focus. Guru Focus also have a screener, but Guru Focus you have to pay. You know, I see. yeah. Okay. So this free stuff. Yeah, free stuff. <laughs> and of course, uh, if the service is good, Guru Focus, you subscribe, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. If it's good service, of course, it's worth uh, subscribing. Yes. Um, and of course. First is, for example, this company, right? If you take a look, their revenue has been growing. Wow. Uh, what well, expen so nice. exponential rate, right? Yeah. Very good, right? From 2009, so for the past eight years, it has been doing pretty well mm -hmm. uh, for this company. So you want to look for companies like that. And in their net profit, you can see that it has been going. Okay, some years it might, might decrease, but you knew when, when, when something were to happen, right? You need to dig into a company and say, oh, what happened? What caused the revenue to drop? If it's a temporary thing, one time thing like litigation, fines, and all those, yeah. and it's a short run, it doesn't damage the company uh, structurally over the, in the long run, yeah. it's fine. You can invest, and probably this will be the opportunity for you to get in. Mm -hmm. So uh, then after that, in terms of return on equity, you can see that, oh, okay, see, generally it's maybe 2012 remember i told you exceptional there was an item right? exceptional item la. so maybe you can adjust that if you want to but if you know what's going on then it's fine you can leave it then you can see uh the return on double, equity is slowly going up double digit return double digit return, yeah. Yeah. yeah so above 15 percent in 2017 and then their current ratio you can see that oh they are in short term short term of they have no problem meeting the short-term obligations they are some mm, wow yeah 12, 12, 12 times so it's wow, high achiever high performer so it's good and debt to equity wise, you can see that, oh, they actually don't need a lot of debt to run the company mm, to, to, to yeah. generate those uh, ex exponential growth. So that company is, is Facebook. Oh, Facebook. I'm sure you all know Facebook, right? We mm. use it every day, check on what our friends are doing. Uh, and then revenue growth is about 64% for the past eight years. Net income grow about uh, 70%. For, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm. for the past eight, wow. part eight years. Return on equity, 23, 24%. Current ratio, 13%. 13 times 13 times yeah, yeah. 13, i'm sorry 13 times yeah uh, that to equity is zero so i think this is pr pretty much a strong company that doesn't require a lot of capital to grow and also uh cash flow positive so i mean yeah, worth to take a look right? worth, worth to take a look yeah but you need to do your research but you need to sure. do your homework all these things you cannot just look based on numbers numbers is just historical it's what has happened yeah but going in the future you still have to do your homework and think if there's a prospect to it right mm. yeah yeah so now we will just uh, thanks uh, Kenny for sharing with us your your how you manage your portfolio. You know, being a fund manager can be a very stressful. You know, especially you have to handle the client's emotion as well, not just your own emotion. But as a retail investors, uh, the advantage is always you know they just have to manage themselves well. Yes. Okay. And then and then the rest is you know uh, just looking at which stock to deploy and then it's about well, waiting. Mm. Yeah. So thanks thank, thanks for sharing with us all this. Okay, so I think we have a few questions uh, coming in, uh, and I think, yeah, we'll just go through some of these questions that a lot of you have asked us. Okay, so uh, there's two guys asking, you know, Sanke is one of them, and the other one, I cannot see your name, but basically, isn't it better to buy US ETF? Is it a, a instrument to consider to invest in, uh, you know, just S&P 500 ETFs? What do you think? Um, I think S and P ETF is uh, something that you could look if you if you not that sophisticated of an investor. Mm -hmm. And after that, historically, uh, if you sign up to a certain platform and you can find their historical PE, and if you were to to invest close to their historical median or average price to earning ratio for the US ETFs, I think you, you do uh, do quite well. Over so basically, the for now, the SD, the S and P five hundred ETF is uh, um, is it above the mean? between or it's above you know, it's above. actually a bit overvalued it's about i think 20 if i'm not wrong it's 22 times the last time i yeah. checked and i think the average is about 15 to 18 times yeah yeah so if let's say if the history to what to repeat again and I, like I, back to the point where you when I, mean, I was telling you at the point that if you buy at the peak of the s p 500 right, you still achieve a return of eight percent eight percent eight percent so if you're happy with eight percent you can just buy and, and wait over long <laughs> yeah. term but and in that provided you also must believe in donald trump <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not so sure about that, but <laughs> yeah. 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 well, uh, generally, of course, I think uh, I prefer to buy the mean, if not below, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So for now, it's slightly a bit pricey for S and P 500 ETF. Yeah. But if you generally do not want to time the market, you know, now you can slowly, you know, uh, take up some 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 share and then make sure you have uh, cash to buy when it's down. 
Yeah, actually, yeah. what what I say is don't rush, don't rush, don't never rush. rush. The yeah. one lesson that I learned that will improve your uh, if one thing that I will say to improve your return is not rushing and waiting for the right time to enter. If you're in for the long run, wait for the right time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next question comes from uh, Daryl. Uh, Daryl asks, what is your take on Alibaba? Alibaba. Yeah. So Jack Ma just become a member of uh, communist member. Communist member. Alibaba. He actually stepped down from uh, Alibaba, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> Alibaba will be almost like Amazon over here. And then, of course, I think it takes some time for uh, China. China is now... Uh, for people to become more and more affluent and once they become more affluent, a lot of people will start to buy a lot of things from Alibaba and but Alibaba will eventually struggle from the issue of uh, uh, products like a lot, a lot of fake products on their website and uh. um, platform. The reason why JD is able to uh, compete with them in the short run is because JD, they, they are very good. They always uh, connect Prioritize with the, on prioritize on, yeah, yeah. selling uh, real, real legit goods. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, But I think Alibaba by itself is really huge. Uh, company. I mean, they are they are e-commerce company. A large chunk of their money come from there. But now they are into payment. They are also into uh, cloud. Oh, by the way, you don't really get much of a payment from Alibaba. Alibaba, right? Yeah, because a payment is owned by N Financial, and most oh, of yes, it, yeah, yeah, almost of it is owned by Jack Ma. So then, mm -hmm. when you get Alibaba, you purely get the, the store online the store part of it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And the next question comes from Adrian. Uh, Adrian asks. I'm an income investor. Uh, do you recommend me to look at USA stocks? Most US stocks only pay less than 2% yield. Um, I actually think that if you're an income investor, I think you should look at Singapore as best, especially if like looking like REITs because something that you understand and the real estate in here, the the space is very limited and you know that there's also a limited supply. There's li limited things you can do. So people who have, uh, have uh, strategic assets in different areas, they actually have some sort of... Uh, I would say monopoly or some sort of mode yes. to it. Yeah. yeah. So. so, but uh, basically the US, I think the tax on dividends, right? Yeah. Uh, I think 30%. Uh, that's, 30 that, that's, for, that's for US, but for, for uh, foreign, foreign foreign investors, foreign you're, not, investors. You, you're not taxed. You're not taxed. Yeah. So, but yeah, anyway, for US market, uh, I also think that I think it's more for investing for capital gain rather than dividends. Yeah. Yep. So, Landon asks, what are some defensive stocks in the Singapore or US market you will recommend? Okay, so anything that we share with you here is not for recommendations. Okay, so any 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 stocks that you are looking at now, can uh, Actually, I'm not really <laughs> looking now, but actually I come across a few. And defensive stocks. Defensive stock, okay. okay. So, but the thing, defensive stock, uh, I just want to caution you all guys. Uh, when you say defensive stock means the revenue will not drop, doesn't mean the price will not drop during a... A financial oh, yes. crisis yeah. right so i need to put that across and some defensive stuff that you can look at is basically uh something there are a few companies that you look at but uh, mm. it's not a recommendation to buy but that's png nestle that you can look uh Co coca-cola you can look and you can look at a company called the vita the vita is basically a dialysis company so they mm -hmm. provide they're mm -hmm. one of the top two largest dialysis company in the us and then at the same time there's one called monroe that you can look at they basically fix uh, cars and they are one of the largest in terms of a uh, car workshop in the yeah. eastern eastern United States okay so yeah. uh, then there's a next question coming from uh, okay we will turn the live okay so you get to see us and then we will just look at some of the questions that's coming in uh, what are the medium do you use to invest in US stocks uh, with less Commission, if possible, because of the forex exchange, we always hamper any stock gains. Noel actually asked this question. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, for US stocks, you can use Chow Shop in Singapore. It charges, yeah. I think, it costs about five dollars per trade. Oh. And then uh, another, uh, what I'm using is actually, actually, there's a few platform you can use. I think yeah. of Swim about ten dollars. I think per trade. I think of Swim ten dollars. That's with TD Ameritrade. And then after that, you can also use uh, what I'm using is actually sex, uh, sexo, sexo, sexo capital. Mm, so okay. per trade is about three, uh, three dollars, and mm -hmm. I open a US dollar account. So what I like is I can control uh, the the currency. So I usually I usually uh, convert the currency at my bank, mm -hmm. and then I wire the money over to my account. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So okay. So um, we are also using an interactive broker mm -hmm. ourselves. I think interactive brokers charge a very uh, low commission rate, but I need to have at least a uh, hundred thousand, you know, to put into the 
custodian account, if not, they will charge you, I think, 10 US dollar a month. Okay, so uh, like if you have a good sizable portfolio, you can consider interactive broker. It's very, very competitive. You need to have a minimum, yeah. right? Yeah, you need to have a minimum. If not, they will charge you a certain fees. Yes. Yeah. Inactivity, inactive fees are basically the core. Uh, next questions come from uh, Yao King. Yao King basically asks, would you recommend Berkshire Hathaway B share over S&P? Historically, it seems to perform much better than, yeah, basically the, uh, the Berkshire Hathaway perform better than S&P 500. Uh, yes, definitely. I, I actually, to be honest, <laughs> I, I actually prefer Berkshire S&P over S&P. Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, Berkshire Hathaway over the okay, ETFs generally. It did, because Berkshire, yeah. if you look at the track record, they yeah. have beaten uh, S&P most of the time. I think they only uh, lost to the S&P like once, once or twice over the past 50 years. So I think Berkshire and also is conservative, ma uh, conservatively managed and it generate a very strong cash flow year over year. And you have, basically when you invest in Berkshire, you're basically mm -hmm. passing, uh, you, you're letting yeah. Warren Buffett uh, top manage. homes and tech yeah. wrestler to manage your money for you. And you pay Warren Buffett hundred thousand dollars a year. Yes, <laughs> the, it's peanuts actually based on the portfolio he is actually managing. Yes. Yeah. So I think I, I agree with uh, Kenny actually. Um, uh, you actually get a top mind managing your money for you, mm. right? So mm. for Pachar and the way. So that's why uh, this also answer to some of the previous question. What is a defensive stock? In the U.S. market, and I think Berkshire Hathaway is pretty much uh, yes. stable. And yeah, Warren Buffett with you managing your money, uh, he doesn't earn fees from from managing your money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only exactly. like the, the salary, right? Mm. Yeah. So the next questions come from Damien. Okay, Damien asks, do you use any platform or system that trigger an alert when the share price hit your target price? Because as a retail investors, we can't always monitor the stock prices. Do you have any? tools to recommend to our listeners here? Uh, actually, I, I, I do not have any tools. Have, so yeah. you remember what's your target price? No, no when, I, when I have money to invest, then I, every day I will check Yahoo then Finance we'll, and, and, and okay. just scroll through. But if I have no money, I think there's no point. <laughs> <laughs> it will trigger uh, uh, and, yeah. and I, I have no money to invest, I feel better. So generally when you have yeah. uh, money, then you actually lock, lock in certain companies that are very close to your trading price, Yes. the target price, and yeah. then you just monitor them you know, actively. Yeah, until it came off. Especially uh, during the corrections when there's a trade war, when people get sold down, that's the time to actually look at. Yeah. But so, if not, sometimes I think you can find opportunity by reading newspaper. Yeah. So for example, now they say, oh, uh, trade war, certain tariffs, maybe mm -hmm. it won't affect certain company as yeah. bad, so I'll dig into it. Like last time there was like mm -hmm. uh, oil price yeah. drop. So mm -hmm. I was uh, I will start to look at refiners and also because- I see. Yeah. I see. So, um, Next question is, uh, Yao King also asks, is Disney considered a defensive stock? Okay, I think one one of the way, I think I, I, I just be very straightforward. For any company that if you were to identify whether it's a, a mm -hmm. defensive stock or not, mm -hmm. just go to a year between 2000, before the crisis, right? One year before the crisis, the yeah. financial crisis, and then look two years ahead. If the revenue were to drop off a lot, then probably mm -hmm. that is not a, a yeah. defensive stock. And if the revenue continues to stay the same or increase, that is a defensive stock. Yeah. That's actually a quick and dirty ways to look at whether business is sustainable or not. Yes. Yeah. So generally, I think if I remember correctly, Disney sales and profit has been holding up pretty well. Uh, but the, the, the uh, big chunks actually still come from the uh, one of the channels that they own. Um, ESPN. ESPN, yes. yes. ESPN has been actually disrupted by the, you know, the stream OTT, players mm -hmm. like Netflix. And I think uh, consumers' also behavior has changed. Uh, nowadays, we watch over the tablet. We don't just lock into the television in the old days where you sit down and then watch on a certain time slot. Mm -hmm. okay, so because of that, I think ESPN is a big chunk of Disney. That part has been coming out over the last few years. Uh, now they're trying to you know, acquire Fox, which they have successfully acquired. Mm -hmm. They're going to introduce a new platform similar like Netflix, mm. and I look forward to subscribe to the platform actually. <laughs> okay, so but Disney itself, the theme park I think is quite uh, so far resilient. Uh, yeah. I love going to Disney and I was in Orlando uh, this year. Okay, I was really happy there, like a kid. <laughs> okay, so yep, uh, uh, Chia Wei asks, where can I find free US company research report? Mm. Actually, it's quite difficult. Like you will monitor all these. Sometimes you can find free on the on Google. Yeah. But it's usually uh, outdated. I'll say outdated. 
is, yeah. is outdated. So yeah. basically, uh, there's no free. Uh, so I actually heard from a few of my friends if you have accounts with Ping and Swim, yeah, actually you get to access uh, some of the institutional report. Yeah, actually sometimes some of these brokerage they yeah. actually partner with all these uh, Broker brokerage 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 firm. brokerage firm or the banking side or the banking research side. So they supply them information, but you usually will not get everything that you you want out for every company that you are looking for. Yeah. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Usually this kind of thing, you have to pay to get. And then sometimes I, I don't think they provide as much insights uh, as you, you would have thought, uh, I would think. Like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically you need to be a client of the company. Uh, a lot of time, you know, let's say you like JP Morgan's report, then you need to be their client in order to access that. Mm -hmm. right? In Asia, I think it's slightly different. Um, nowadays you have a website that actually pub freely pub publicize, you know, other other people's report online yeah. for free, so you can actually read it. If you yeah. want the analyst yeah. opinion, you can always go news. Sometimes they have a short excerpt of what so, they think yeah. after the earnings call come out, and then then CNBC will will report like this analyst thing that it will not go well or why, and then they will of course usually have opposing views and they say oh this analyst thought like actually it's not bad. It, that they will adjust the target price mm -hmm. upwards because of certain mm -hmm. measures. So you can get certain clue from there, and then after that, do your own homework from there say who's right, who's wrong, and why, you know, at least get a second opinion on, on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, there's this question that's asking, when is a good time and price to buy Facebook? Jaden asks. Oh, <laughs> well, isn't that like stock tips? Eh? Oh, that is a stock tip. So we are not, we are not, we are not allowed to, <laughs> to, to, to do this right yeah, over here. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, not really, uh, yeah. Sorry, Jaden. Yeah, okay. But yeah, it's time to work. But, but it's <laughs> worth looking at, at it. Yes, yes, <laughs> okay. that's right. The hint is there, right? Yeah, the hint is there, yeah. yeah that's right. All right. It could be a buy and sell, right? <laughs> yeah, it could, it could. All right. So uh, next question comes from Dan. Okay, so Dan asks, looking at some of the stock examples, there are points where you will sell. Uh, what are the points you consider to sell? When would you sell the stock? Because previously, some of those companies that you have hold, you sold it. And they went up even more, right? You was you sold because you have to dissolve the fund, yes. not because that you you want to sell it. Yes. Yeah. So when will be the time where you will sell those stocks in the portfolio? Okay. Um. Yeah. So there are a few things. So fun, once it's Lynette, right? Lynette yeah. is because I I I didn't buy because of the acquisition, but initially when they acquired the company, mm. I thought it would be it's a good idea. It's not bad, yeah. you know. And but usually when you acquire a company, when you bid for a company, you generally pay at fair fair value or actually above fair value, maybe 10 or 15% or above value. Then mm. after that, they they lost a uh, major customer, 40% of the revenue. Oh, I think, yeah, okay, yeah. this is not what, what I bought the company for mm. and it's a sign that I should sell, okay. right? Because the thing is acquisition also, you have to go through restructuring, selling of things, laying off people. There's a lot of things to do and it's not yeah. very easy. And then another thing is, for example, Facebook, right? If another social media platform were to come out or there's a de decline in the number of users, lose interest, people do not trust them because of the data breach, so on and so forth. And that's where mm -hmm. I start to notice. And then they are, they are not able to co uh, charge that amount of price for adverti uh, advertisements. Mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. when I start to say, think, think twice about the company and maybe perhaps sell at a later date once I confirm yeah. that, okay, this is a, it's a permanent trend. Uh, that's going to happen over the next uh, three to five years or there's a new competitor on the horizon that's uh, that's fighting for market share, yeah. stealing market share yeah. from them. So for now, it's like TikTok, this app, you know, yeah. trying to come in. But TikTok is a very different uh, target market. So these are things that uh, uh, ch uh, changes. So you, as long as basically you will sell when the initial reason of buying the company has changed. Yes. And that could be the fundamentals yes. of the company. You know. Yes, assuming assuming that Snapchat is doing well, but after that, if you notice on the ground, people are actually using more Instagram towards uh, the later yeah. part, and people think that it's more user friendly, and they came up with these Insta stories, and you just realize that oh okay, mm -hmm. and people slowly are using less and less Snapchat, and that's when I say oh maybe it's a good time to sell, you know that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, but basically, if you have uh, good stocks, the fundamental doesn't change, mm. and then you keep it. Right, it's yes. just like a good wife. Yeah, you know, why doesn't give you a lot of trouble? <laughs> yes, give you a wife. But also, also don't expect growth to be like linear, like what five, ten, fifteen percent year over year. Sometimes yeah. it will be ten percent. It's fine. It's okay. So every month you get it once, right, from your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, just uh, make this uh, webinar more interesting, right? No yes, offense. Yes. Spice it up. He's trying to spice it up. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, John asks, 
Bruce Victor here asked Kenny to look into the camera. Kenny, oh. you need to look at the camera. Okay, okay. Hi, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think I think they, they want to look, they want to see how it looks like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then next question is uh, well, I think there are a lot of questions, and I think we are almost uh, running out of time. I'll just two more? try to go two more. Two okay. More, more. So let's pick uh, two more questions. And the question is from um, Chung Fong. Okay. Uh, when do you average up, and how do you average up? Average up. When do you decide to let's say, hey, look, I have this stock, I want to average up. You don't average up. It's just like year after year, the intrinsic value will change based on yeah. the the com company. So you re revalue the company, mm -hmm. and you buy an intrinsic value or below intrinsic value. So okay. yeah, but don't think of it. Don't think as averaging up because the price is higher. It, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you need to be objective because the company could be worth one dollar today. Yes. Let's say next year the value will grown to one fifty. Mm. And if the price is still the same or even higher than you bought, but the discount is to the intrinsic value is bigger, yeah. Then it makes sense to buy more. Yes, you buy more. Yeah. Yes. So basically don't look at don't anchor based on so, the previous price. Yes. Imagine yeah. this, right? You own a business and, and it's a ten million dollar business that but you generate one extra extra million dollars in cash. Yeah. So is the business worth more or less? So you pay a higher price for mm. it or lower price for it. But if you pay the same price, you actually under you actually buy at a very cheap value. From, from that target price that you bought, assuming they enter at that price, mm -hmm. right? $10 million mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. for $11 million. Like imagine the overall worth yeah. of the company went up by $1 million mm -hmm. and you still continue to pay $10 million for it. Yeah. So yeah. it doesn't make sense. You should pay $11 million for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So the last question, okay, from um, Daryl. Okay. What is your advice for those who are fearful in the trade war? Is it a good time to be invested or would it be better to wait because there's so much uncertainty in the market now? Yeah, so for, for me, yeah. it's all about valuation. You should focus mm. on the valuation. Trade war is, it will probably affect the auto companies, you know, because of the tariffs mm -hmm. or maybe those companies that sell a washing machine like uh, Whirlpool. If I'm not wrong, Whirlpool, this company that sell Whirlpool. Mm -hmm. You just need to see, you don't have to follow macro news closely, but you think about this macro news, who will it affect? how it will affect them when because for example automakers where what will, how it will affect them is cost will start to increase yeah. and the government like donald trump is forcing them to take on employ more of the local workers with a certain amount of wages so they're forcing mm -hmm. of that forcing them to pay salary to to create employment for these people which doesn't make sense so eventually the prices of cars will go up a lot of consumer prices for a lot of things in the U united states will eventually go up but i don't think this will go on forever mm -hmm. or it will it will, uh, will go out of hand because eventually there will be a re-election in 2020. So I think Donald Trump will become very unpopular if prices were to <laughs> go out of hand, right? You will not elect elect him or, or vote for him if he, if, he, if he, you know, lowers your standard of living because you cannot afford a lot of things and wages are not really growing. But overall, I think the US market is uh, economically is doing quite well, right? As of yeah. now, of course, yeah, I'm, not, of I'm not forecasting the future because I do not know. Yeah. But right now it's to ignore everything and wait wait for the right price and the price that you're happy to get in with and start to accumulate shares uh right that's that's what i yeah i recommend and also just not just to link back some of the precise that you talk about you need to be financially stable first yes yeah having your insurance you know protected basically you are, you are well protected and then you have your emergency cash yes all these are personal finance you need to manage it well if you don't get it right then i think you know, let's say if you were to invest your children education fund that he, your kids is going to need it in the next one year, of course you're going to be afraid because that is the only money that you have to let your kids to study yes. overseas. And then naturally the value that you put in the stock market drop, of course your heart will sink. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, you will be af you'll be very afraid and then very fearful and then you start to sell. Actually, yeah. that's why I call, I uh, told most of my friends, it's like, it's a, it's a self sabotage You basically put yourself in a very bad environment. Yeah. Yeah, right? So your loved ones and everything, sometimes their emotion, they mean a whole lot more to you. So mm -hmm. sometimes things do not go well, you, you do not have a job and you have, have bills to pay and they have, they, they're all coming in on you real hard. Let's like mm -hmm. say, oh, why are you not good and here and there? And you start to make irrational decisions and you don't want to be, put yourself in that kind of position. So yeah. you must make sure that you're well protected and invest money that's excess, excess your yeah. excess money, yeah. basically. Invest yeah. the money that you can afford to lose. 
Yes, yeah. that's right. That is also and have the right expectation in terms of the return that you, you're, you're planning to get, you know, like the yeah. price you pay and the value you get out of it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, okay, so that's all we have, uh, Kenny, have for you guys. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of questions that we can't answer them, and I hope that, you know, you can join us in the next webinar. I think uh, we will have more session with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> so, nice meeting you guys. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Kenny is really good in the US market, so I think uh, in the future, you know, we, you guys get to interact with him more. He also write, you know, on the person, so you get to write his, see his articles as well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Yes. Thank you uh, very much. Nice webinar and a very uh, good evening to you guys and see you guys soon. See you. Okay. Bye. Bye.